All right. So our objective today is to learn to solder um, by building one of these uh, LED heart light uh, kits. Uh, so a bunch of you now have those kits and some of you might have your own soldering equipment or you might have uh, one of these boxes. So I'm gonna walk through the box. We'll, we'll talk about uh, the items that are in it. Uh, your items might look a bit different, but that's, uh, that's okay. Um, I am not a professional solderer uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I have learned by doing activities and events like, like this and figured out how to get by. But if you advance past this uh, introductory level, you may well find that there's a lot of tips and tricks and things that uh, I'm not introducing to you because I'm not aware of them. Uh, but what, what I should be able to do is get you started at that, uh, that very basic level to do a project like this and, and understand some of the concepts. Um, so let's figure out what our tools of the trade are. Uh, so inside of the kit that you have, we're going to have several uh, items that we are going to be using today. Um, one of the things that was uh, asked just prior to this uh, starting was what tip do you want to use? Now, I think your soldering iron is going to come with a tip. Uh, I would probably just start by using that. That's a fine tip. We're doing fine things. Um, you can use a larger tip if you're working with larger wires or uh, other things where you want to transfer more heat. Um, but I would just stick with the fine um, fine pin that is included on the soldering iron. So let's, let's start with that. Uh, if you haven't already done it with your kit, you're going to want to uh, assemble your stand. Uh, I'm going to use a, a stand that I have, but... Uh, you just assemble it. There's some bolts that come with it, and that goes together. And we're going to be using, uh, this is lead-free soldering uh, wire. Uh, and it should have a, uh, it's called a rosin core. So one of the things that you're fighting when you are uh, connecting metals or soldering is oxidation. So oxidation, it's the oxygen in the air combining with the metal and creating a crust or like a, essentially a rust uh, on that material. And that will prevent it from bonding to things. And uh, rosin, as I understand, is from a, uh, it's called flux as well. Uh, it's from a tree uh, and it uh, helps to remove and clean that oxidation layer so that those two metals can become in direct contact and with the heat, they actually make a chemical bond. If you just heat them without removing that oxidation, it's gonna, they're gonna just sit on top of each other with a layer in between that's not gonna be conductive. And so that is, we're, we're going for conductivity. So good that you have the uh, flux. You have it in another form, which uh, in this case is in this little box. And you see there's a, like a gel inside it. That's that same material, the same material that's inside the core of this. So it's metal surrounded by a flux in the middle. So it gets delivered right where you want it. Um, so we can plug in our soldering irons. Uh, it also comes with this little sponge. You're going to use a sponge to clean off your uh, soldering iron in between uh, different uh, soldering applications. Now there's a few other items in here uh, for desoldering and so on but maybe we will uh, jump to talking about them once we have uh, started the project. I wanna leave as much time as possible for doing the soldering. Uh, my aim is going to be that there's enough time that you can finish the project entirely while we're here on the call, uh, but especially as beginning solderers, some of you are probably gonna to wanna to take a lot more time with those. In that case, I'm gonna move ahead and uh, you, we'll get the concept and you'll be able to finish up the 
you know, all the repetitive soldering and practice uh, on your own. So uh, depending on your, how aggressive you are, you may or may not get to the point where uh, you have the finished product by the end of this. Uh, I believe that most of you haven't soldered before. Is that is that correct? Has anybody soldered before and want to share an experience? Um, I did a very tiny little armature. I made a little skeleton, but it was just sort of globbed together with tons and tons of solder. <laughs> so nothing so fun as this. Yeah, and, and there is such a thing as too much solder. Um, so you're you're going to see that what you really want is a uh, like a volcano, people will say, or a cone. Um, if you see something that looks like a Hershey kiss or a drop of water uh, that's bulbous or convex uh, around that pin, uh, you know you've put on too much. And it may, the thing is you don't know when it's like a volcano, you know that that bottom is bonding to the pad that it's on. When it's not like a volcano and it's like a, a ball, it could be bonded or it could be not bonding to that bottom because both of those look, uh, look the same. So it dis it could disguise a connection that's gonna connection that's gonna haunt you. Um, so we've looked at our soldering iron. So what, what you might want to do is get it get your soldering iron plugged in uh, and get it warmed up because it will take a little while for it to get up to temperature. Uh, it does have a uh, little gauge on here. Different uh, different ones are gonna have different things. And we're going to want to turn it up to like, assuming this is Fahrenheit, uh, we're pretty much going to want to turn it up all the way. Um, yeah. This one is in Celsius, so like 400 C. Ah, ah, it's in Celsius. Okay. So now we can look at, uh, so 400 Fahrenheit which translates to like 217. So I'd probably put it like three, 300, 325. Cool. Yeah, so right between the red and the green on these and in, in, that is in Celsius. And this is my stand. Yeah, I was gonna. What's an appropriate uh, workspace protection? You need something non-flammable or cardboard or. Yeah, so ideally you get something that's non-conductive. They have these like blue anti-static mats, uh, and that way you're not getting any electric static charge on it. Uh, I would try and work on a non-conductive surface in general. That way you're not going to uh, damage any of the components um, with something staticky. Um, another thing about your work area is it's good to be ventilated. So I have a little just desk fan running in here and I have a window open, um, because the rosin does, it's not the, the metal vaporizing, it's the rosin flux. And so, uh, you don't want to be breathing that in, um, even when it's non lead, leaded solder. It doesn't mean that it's, um, you know, particularly healthy to breathe. So, uh, yeah, we don't have non-conductive mats. We're just going to work with what we have. We're not working with components that are going to be particularly uh, terribly sensitive. Um, certainly, he, these you know you can't see that this is hot, but this is hot, so uh, it will burn anything it touches. So don't let it touch your laptop. Don't let it touch your arm. Um, I'm also going to recommend that folks uh, put on some sort of eye protection. Uh, it is unusual. But it is, it can happen that uh, solder will flick or uh, will sp spatter. And you don't want that to impact you for the rest of your life. So safety goggles, particularly in our beginning stages. Uh, so other than that, uh, work environment, you probably don't have these. Uh, it's very common to have helping hands. Uh, I'm gonna use them particularly because I need to position things for the camera. Uh, but these are just things that you can use to hold on to a board and often will have a magnifying glass and so on. Uh, that's a nicety to get, but not part of what you need. Uh, makes sense? You guys comfortable with your workspaces? 
All right. Not hearing any squawking. Let's take a look at what we got uh, component-wise and what we have for the board. So uh, I think what I will do is swap over to the other camera, which will take me just a second to change over the audio. And I will be, uh, that way we can all look at the components closely together. All right, so you should now be hearing me, which will be drawing uh, the focus to the other, um, to the camera with the microscope on it. And I'm gonna go to Spotlight so you can see. Um, well, right before you, you see a, a PCP uh, printed circuit board. And uh, on it, uh, you're probably familiar with having seen some of these, is essentially a code for what uh, what components you're going to put onto this board. Uh, does anybody recognize any of these and want to guess at which components go where? Well, we'll, we'll go through the components. And hopefully yeah. that will say, be I see, a, I see yeah. a DC input. Oh, which, where do you see input? Uh, or at least like a, a DC, like a direct current oh, yeah. um, on the right hand side in the like upper part of the heart. Um, there's yeah. S1 power and then yeah. DC four to six volts. So the, yep. for the five volt power supply. So funny enough, you pick the one place where there is not a component for it. Uh, that's where we're going to connect two wires, which then we'll bootleg over to a battery. Um, okay. Had I been thinking about this a little better, I would have included a uh, battery carrier, and we can get you guys some later. Um, but right now, we're just uh, I'll show you how to just hold the, the things against the battery. Um, so I'll just start grabbing components, and we can talk about them. So uh, this little blue guy is uh, an adjustable thing. It's called a potentiometer. Um, so you can turn, you can turn it and it will change the uh, electrical you know, outcome uh, on these pegs. So there's, there's that, that's one item. Um, this one, anybody know what this is? It's a the other computer. Sorry, what was that? It didn't switch over to the microscope. It's not switching over to the microscope. Um, oh, I can see. Okay. I just pinned that screen so it's full screen. Oh, wait. Oh, um, you pin the old one? Be, so it, unless you I might know. have something wrong pinned because I'm seeing it on my computer. And whenever I talk, it is going to the microscope. So if you're not getting that, make sure you don't have the wrong screen pinned. Great, thank you. Yep, okay. So uh, this component. Um, it's a switch. It is a switch, exactly. So you could push it in, push it out, and then it's going to change the conductivity between those pins. So we've got, a, we've got a switch, we've got a, a little potentiometer, um, all right, what do you guys think this is? Capacitor? Yeah, that is a little capacitor. So capacitor is like a uh, battery um, that's very momentary. So it will like hold a charge and then uh, trickle it out. And there's lots of little different ratings for how those work. You can see on the side here, this has uh, 47 uh, nano uh, farads. So that's one thing. Uh, then we have this little square doohickey. Um, and maybe. I have no idea. Yeah, you have no idea? Um, nope. 
let's let's practice something. So uh, let's see if we can look it up. So if somebody wants to go to uh, Aero Electronics, um, or I can do it on mine, we can type in this number. So it looks like it is uh, S uh, S eight zero five zero. And that should enable us to look up information about that component. And um, well, one person's doing that. Maybe transistor. a transistor. Does it say at all what a transistor does? Um, I just put it into Google. Um, oh, OK. Yeah, out of Google. That's fine. So one thing that's useful is you can look up what are called data sheets and often um, mouser or Aero or some of these large electronic suppliers will have the sheets available because they're trying to sell these components and people need to see the sheets. Uh, so you can look up these numbers and then get a, a detail for these. Do you want to try and type in uh, what this guy is? Can you read it? The little eight-footed. Yeah, this little eight-footed one. Let's see why a magnifying glass is considered helpful. Yeah, so well, it should be on my screen, too. So I'm trying to make it so you can see it. It's so, not quite in focus. Oh, OK. I, uh... right. Well, All right, I can. Uh... It's a diode. Not a diode. Damn it. Um, so the number on it is GM one HS GM one eight six HS. Now there's a number, another number underneath it. Uh, LM three five eight P. Let's try. Let's try that too. LM three five eight P. Standard operational amplifier. Standard operational amplifier. So all, otherwise known as an op amp. So the transistor acts as a gate. Uh, what you do is, and there's different types of transistors, but basically the idea is that you can put a signal uh, to one of these wires and that will, uh, a small amount of electricity can stop a greater amount of electricity traveling between the two other wires. So it's like you're using a small amount to open and close a door to allow the bigger flow to go through. So that's what a transistor does. And it's used in stereos and computers and it's what you see um, this is one of the fundamentals of electronics. And then an op amp, this is actually uh, a whole set of components within, within here. And it is, it is doing something similar, but to my understanding is it's uh, delivering scaled uh, resistance. So the more you put on an input, the uh, more that it's going to amplify uh, out of one of the other pins. So there's a, a relationship between them and there's going to be a low threshold and a thri high threshold where those don't work and that's where you look at the data sheet to figure out what um, what's going to work for you but uh, this is uh, this is that component uh, so it's an it's an amplifier so what we're going to need to do is figure out how we want to assemble this and do we want to start from the inside out or the outside in? I'd say it's probably easiest for us to start from the inside out. And I think resistors are a good place to start. Uh, we haven't even talked about resistors. That's these guys. Does anybody know? Um, they resist, right? Uh, and the amount of resistance they apply to the current is related to or is indicated by these little stripes on them. Uh, and 
there's a methodology. You can get a key to interpret them. So we'll end up doing that uh, next to try and figure out where we're going to put these resistors. On the board, you see that we have several different spots for resistors. We have, uh, looks like a 100K resistor, a 10K resistor, a 47, a 47, a 47, and then a 22 over here. So those are there's big differences in those numbers. So we want to make sure that we get them uh, on the right thing. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and figure out how to calculate uh, resistors. I'm going to share a screen. I'm going to guess that the bundle of three are the 47. Well, you're using deduction, and that's not always uh, available. So the, a resistor chart is going to look something like uh, one of these. Now, I just pulled up one at, at random. And uh, what? I'm actually going to go. I'm going to find a better one. Uh, we'll do this one. Uh, all right, and I'm going to reshare so you can see it. Oh. All right, so uh, you can see that there is, you have to read it from one end to the other, and you get digits from the first colors and so you grab those digits and then the last band the the fourth band is a multiplier so that is it times one is it times ten a thousand ten thousand a hundred thousand and then uh at the end you might have a tolerance um this basically tells you how how closely to that range uh it's going to it's going to stick so, Stephen, you, you said you had one that you thought you knew. Which which color did it start with? Uh, well, how do you tell which end it starts? At? Yeah, so the, the gold uh, should be at, you'll see there will be a gold band. Uh -huh. That's at the, the end of it. So, uh, for example, this one, we've got two red and a black and gold, right? So if we look at the what's the red in the first digit, that's a two. And the second digit is red is a two. And then we have a zero. So we have two, two, zero. Uh, or, oh, the last one's black. So, no, 22. Just plain old 22. Uh, so that is the 22 resistor right there. All right? Oh. Does that make sense? How does this fit on here? So let's take a look at this one that is brown, black, yellow, gold. Can somebody interpret what brown, brown black, yellow, gold would be? One, zero, four, nothing. Oh, I'm. Uh, so the yellow, the last one is the multiplier. Oh, so, so it's Point. times 10. So it's brown, right? You're right, one, and black, zero. And so it's one zero times 10. What's that? Oh, that's the thousand, or the... Yeah, 10K. So it should be 100K. Yeah. So that's our other one. So hopefully this demystifies a little bit what the colors are. Um, and you can, obviously you'd have to keep this chart, or at least I would. Uh, another trick is to do uh, a calculator. I seem to type. The brown, black, orange would then be the ten k. Uh, that that makes sense. Uh, so we can 
Did I just go to the thing that brought me to the same page? Um, so the gold is the last one? Uh, the gold is the last one, yeah, because that is telling you what the resistance is. The uh, I've had a calculator up for it. So there's a calculator online, and you can enter the colors, and uh, that's quite useful. So I'm going to go to my bookmarks. I don't know why it's not showing up now. All right. So just to show you, uh, what's one of the last ones that we have? We have uh, the one that starts with yellow and then goes purple. So I'm going to select yellow on this calculator. I'm going to select purple or violet and orange, which is going to be our multiplier. And then this is gold. So now it's saying 47 uh, with a 5%. So you can see there's multiple multiple ways. This is the easy way, uh, but certainly can be done manually. So now we know where our resistors are going. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to match them up. So let's, let's put them in there and have those be our first, uh, our first things. So, so you want us to start sticking the ends in if we figure exactly. it out? So I'm going to take it off. You're checking to make sure the colors are right. And you're going to, uh, so this is a 47. I like to bend it in advance. Resistors are not uh, sensitive to what direction they go. So we just know we need to put it in the 47. I'm going to push those legs down. And then typically to keep it close, what I'll do is I'll splay the back out a little bit so that you're, um, so that it's staying inside there. So why don't we put in all three of the 47K and then we'll start actually soldering. So hopefully you've had a chance to uh, get those done. And what I'm looking for is just a little bit of a glass of water a moment ago. Um, here it is. Uh, I have the sponge, which is awfully flat. So I'm going to add just a little bit of water to that uh, sponge. It doesn't need to be soaking. just needs to be uh, dampened and so that we can wash our... Thing. You can see it's starting to expand as the, the water takes hold. So that's that's one way we're going to wash our soldering iron. And uh, it should be nice and hot by now. And there's two things we're going to do. We're going to uh, tin it, which means that we are going to take out our lead free solder. And what we want to do is, before we do any soldering, we want to just add a little bit to the tip. Uh, that's tinning, tinning the tip so it has a little bit of solder on it. Uh, we can also uh, 
clean it in our little sponge. Just give it a little little wipe. Uh, and we can, we have the, the rosin. Open this little tube. <laughs> uh, it, it was tough for me. I finally got it. So I had to, I actually cracked the top of it. So that's not, I don't have any special advice other than force. Okay. Um, and so you can see that I'm just going to just dip it right in there and it kind of melts away and that provides some cleaning on it. And okay. So I have a properly, I've tinned, I've gotten my uh, iron nice and hot. I've gotten it clean. And now what I want to do is you'll find that the iron spots where it's hotter than that, the tinning that you did in advance is going to put a little bit of solder on it, which means that the contact that it makes with the pin that you have there, uh, it's the, there's more heat transfer that happens because that solder will start to wrap around. But you don't want to goob it on to the, to the soldering iron. You want to apply it, and you want to apply it after the pin and the pad have gotten hot. So essentially, this, it's two steps. You're putting the solder, soldering iron right against the base of the pin and the pad. You're waiting a second, and then you're applying the uh, this solder, and you're trying just to apply enough that you get that little uh, volcano shape. And you'll see me do it both right and wrong uh, through this. So that'll provide us examples. So there, we just wait a second. Oh, that was good enough. All right, so I didn't really get that one, but so we're gonna we're gonna try again. All right. All right, that was a little better. Um, let's see, let's see what we got. So I might be able to actually uh, focus. No, that didn't work. So I can bring it closer, see if I get it that way. Um, I'm just going to stick with. All right, so you can see it's pretty good. Um, it's right there. It looks pretty volcano-like. It looks adhered to the pad. It's uh, not bubbled. Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. I maybe overheated it a little bit. Join you guys. But go ahead and uh, give a try. See if you can you can try any of these, all of these six. Go through them and try and uh, solder on the point. Let me know. Let me know where you have trouble. Jared, can you explain the tinning part again? Yeah. So tinning is simple. Uh, you're just it's hot. You have your uh, soldering iron, and you're adding the. Uh, solder, just a little bit of solder before. Um, that's probably too much. Just so that there's a little bit on there, and that's going to be a liquid that helps transfer the heat directly to the pin. So I'll try and do uh, another one. So I'm just going to wait for a second on there, and then I bring it in. And then I, that, that was a bad one. Too much solder. All right. Cleaned it up a little bit. So go go ahead and just keep trying that. You know, every every two or three, you can clean off your um, clean off your iron, uh, dip it in a little of the flux.
can see why the little helping hand guys are helpful. Yeah. You should be you should be able to leave it on the table uh, as long as your pins are uh, folded out and um, just do the soldering iron and the. So, Jr. There's like I can touch the pin to the solder, and um, nothing happens except for one little point on the tip, and then it'll vaporize the solder. Uh, one little point on the tip. So, like, there's one little point on the side of the tip where, as soon as you touch that, it makes a nice little puff. Otherwise, I can just poke at it. It sits there all day, and nothing happens. Oh, you mean solder directly to the iron? No, yeah, like, yeah, I'm holding the solder on the iron. Oh, uh, so right at the tip is basically the working area that you're going to deal with. Uh, yeah. So you probably just have to hunt to make sure that that spot is what's touching the, um, is is what is touching the component, right? Uh, you can play a little bit with oh, the temperature, that might help, but... Is that, are you, are you having any success with it? Let's see. So I've got some good ones and some bad ones on mine. And I want you to tell me which of them are the bad ones and which of them are the good ones. So I will uh, point at one. Let me see. Like... It's hard to tell from above. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So, uh, all right. Good one or bad one? I think that's good. It looks like a volcano. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's overdone. It shouldn't have this. I have way too much solder on here. So I, I'd put that as a bad one. But, you know, you're being generous. It probably works. Um, how about this next one? Better? Yeah, I'd say that's a good one. Because it looks like it's bonded to the pad, and it, like, comes directly up the pin. And I'd say this last one is pretty good. It's a little weird. I got like a gob on top, but it looks pretty good. Then I get over here to the other side. And first one looks good, but the next two, maybe at first it looked okay, but clearly I didn't get the heat and the solder down to where the pins are. So those are, those are not good enough. Uh, those might even... Uh, convey the electricity at the beginning, but they're going to cause you trouble because they're not necessarily going to be good connections. They might break and so on. So I'm going to, I'm going to reattack at least these two. Uh, the other ones are passable, if not ideal. How often do you have to reflux the tip? Um, as you're finding it's not effective, uh, every two, three, four, five times, um, mileage may vary. All right. So that's a, it's a little better. Um, you know, I'm overheating it, so I'm getting a lot of, and I have some flux left over on there, but 
Uh, looks like I have my soldering points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back into the kit where there is these handy-dandy scissors, and I'm going to clip down these ends so that they're not in my way for the next steps. All right, so now we have, should have some soldered on resistors. That's, uh, that's the, the magic there. Now we're going to go through, we're going to practice this a bunch, but um, that's the, <laughs> that's the fundamental. Uh, you'll get, a, you'll get a lot of practice. So let's let's go ahead and add the well, well where where are people in adding those resistors? All done. All done? Okay. So it's, I'll bet some people are still working, of course. Some people are done. So since there's a few done, let's um, bravely move forward. Does anybody recall or want to look up? Uh, one of the other resistors. Let's make sure that we're putting them in the right place. Red, red was a 22. 22. All right, I'm going to do 22. Red, red in the 22. So this is a good example of another type of bad solder. Um, so that, my friends, you see how that's like a little bubble? The, yep. the one right there. That's bad. That could that might not be bonded below. That might have not cleared, and uh, so it's 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 hard to tell what's going on there. So. I'm using too much solder. I'm going to uh, melt that. Now we can we can do a few things. Uh, I sort of just got to it, and now it's a little clearer that it's okay. Uh, but had I wanted to remove the solder and start again, I have a couple of tools that came in your toolbox. Uh, there's something called a solder whip, and it really likes solder. So when this is the solder wick that, uh, I think that's the one you got in your kit today. Oh no, you got a different one in your kit that was sitting up. That was like Radio Shack. Yeah, I know. Sorry. My, my kit's old. Uh, it's this blue, this blue thing, and you'll see it has a little copper mesh that comes out. And so all we need to do is to get solder off of something. So I have kind of a mess over here with this one. I can get that a little hotter and then I can touch the uh, well, not doing the best example. But uh, let me see if I can get that. Uh, so it'll you essentially just use it to pick up and wick away solder from the spots that you don't want it. The other uh, item for removing solder is called a solder sucker. Or 
Um, does anybody want to guess what the solder sucker looks like in your kit? Yep, you got it. It is it is this thing. It looks like a little pen. Uh, so with that, what you do is you depress the back uh, plunger. You heat up your solder uh, so it's liquidy. You put the gun right next to it, and you put that button. And what it will do is that plunger will pop back, creating a little vacuum in front, and will suck out the solder. So in this case, I actually pretty much cleared that little hole of solder. Because remember, there's a whole bunch there, and now it's almost empty. So if you're going to be removing components, uh, you might use uh, a tool like this to get rid of a lot of the solder, and then you could uh, remove the components. Often it's still tough. Uh, sometimes you actually have to add a little more solder to it to help get the old solder out. Um, but I'm going to re-solder that. And now you know about uh, solder wicks and uh, the little vacuum solid solder pump remover thing. I will see Domino's in a little bit. Now we're going to do the next resistor. Um, does anyone remember brown, black, yellow? Go ahead. Pretty sure brown, black, yellow was the hundred. Yeah. Well, let's let's double check to be sure. We don't want to get this wrong. Yeah, I know brown, black, orange is the ten. Okay. Brown, brown black, black one, black is zero, and then the yellow is a ten k multiplier. Yeah. So that's the hundred. The I will put it in. It is really hard to tell the brown and the purple apart. Are we doing brown, black, yellow, or brown, black, orange? Uh, we are, well, I just was doing both of them. So okay. the brown, black, yellow goes in the uh, the side, which is the 100K, and then the brown, black, orange goes in the 10K. We consult my reference. Yeah, that's that's correct. So I, you can also see what it looks like. on the uh so this is this is what this is what you should be getting
to go ahead and uh, do the next step. Uh, now, resistors, it doesn't matter what way they go. But some components, it does matter what they, way they go. So we're going to do the capacitor next. And you can see that the capacitor has an uh, indicator on the uh, on on the board. It also has uh, legs, one leg that is small and one leg that is long. And you can see that it has some markings on it that indicate showing you that confirming that the small leg is the negative and by opposite the uh, long leg is the positive. And you can see on here, it gives you an indication of where the positive is, and then the darker area, just like on the side of it, is the negative. So we're going to go ahead and put the uh, capacitor in, in the way that it is suggesting, and the same way that you soldered the resistors. Hey, JR, can you show us the position of that again, just so we can... Sure. So uh, you'll notice on the resistor, there's the side that has the, the white coloration indicating it's negative. Yeah. And you can see underneath, there's the white coloration to match. Okay, right? yeah, I thought you said the dark side went on that, and I got confused. No, okay, sorry, I, I also could have misspoken. So dark to dark and light to light. Yep, that's my understanding. And if we're wrong, we're going to get to practice the uh, desoldering. But I'm pretty sure I'm right. It makes sense. The underside, one of the one of the circular does that out poles uh, uh you know the the, the pads are circular and non-circular yeah uh what does that mean that might mean negative and positive i think it does no so that's uh now you're getting advanced <laughs> Hey, JR, my two yeah. solder points on that seem to have uh, merged together. Is this uh -huh. like a problem? <laughs> yes, that is a problem because the electricity will go in the way you don't want it. Uh, and so that's called an electrical bridge, uh, but it's not a bridge you want to take. So yeah. you're going to use the solder sucker, and you're going to try and remove some of that solder that bridge them. Uh, you might just want to remove a bunch and then, you know, try again. Okay. Uh, so that's what the solder sucker is for. And the solder sucker does take a little bit of coordination uh, to get that timed right and not shake. And so be ready to practice a little. So I think next I'm going to take on the chip just because it's in the center and it's a little, little bit something different. It's not quite the same through hole thing. And uh, we got a quandary here, a quandary, because I don't, do we know which way to put this chip? Does anybody have any ideas of uh, where this chip would go? It goes in the center. We know that, but which way? The little notchy thing facing up. Aha. Yes. Notice that there is a, a small moon notch uh, at the top of that chip. And there's a small moon notch at the top of the diagram. And so with these sort of little um, IC chips, integrated circuit chips, you're going to find that that's a common convention, that there'll be a little moon to a little moon. And we will, uh, we're going to put it in there. I've got some bent legs, so I'm going to have to carefully 
bend these legs back and get it in there. These are tiny little. Yeah, and it, it's like you got to get them just the right amount of squeeze. And so do you bend these pens once they're through? Uh, I'm just sort of giving them a little squeeze before, nothing too crazy. I'm just, you know, with my fingers to get them to the point where they are. Um, and then when you get them through, oh, when you get them through, I would not bend them when you get them through. These type of pins tend to be a little more delicate. Oops. And so I'd be worried about breaking them. You already did. You broke them? No, no. Um bent them okay well as long as you're through you're fine oh, okay you know so i i have them you can see that the pins are sticking out here far less than the other ones these are not even sticking out enough to trim but it's the same deal to solder them these are close together so we are going to have to watch for uh erroneous bridging we don't want to bridge them by mistake so go ahead and we can solder these guys too. And if you fall apart behind in one area, feel free to just skip ahead and, and join us where we are. Don't, don't, uh, it doesn't need to go in a certain order. Good ones and some bad ones. I'm finding myself much more appreciative and impressed with the people who I work with who do this for a living. Yeah. It's it like anything though, give yourself a chance, you know, allow yourself to be a beginner before you judge yourself. Oh, for right. sure. No, it's more like I'm I respect the art form. Yeah, there, there's definitely. Cause like I got one, it's like, oh, I finally got it. And then I realized that it kind of pulled up a little bit on mm -hmm. one side. Um, oh no, did I break the leg? This chip is significantly harder. Yeah. And one of the tricks is, and you shouldn't worry too much about it at this stage, but um, some of these components are sensitive to temperature, and so you don't want to leave it on there too long. Uh, you want to basically get it just hot enough, dab in the solder, and be on your way. So, uh, you know, somebody doing a complex set of components, there really is a lot of a lot of art and any one of these connections that doesn't work 
it's going to require troubleshooting. But you want to get good at, at getting it right. It, is this one of the components that's temperature sensitive? Um, it is, but you shouldn't. I mean, we're learning. So there's a certain uh, expectation that some of these will fail. <laughs> and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get there when we can. So do your best. Don't freak out about overheating, but don't try and overheat it. So the first one that I did, the tip, I wasn't getting a good contact, but it's yep. really clean. And then I cleaned it off a little bit on the sponge. And now yeah. it goes really easily, but they've all got a little bit of brown on them. Uh, that, I mean, that's probably a little bit of the uh, flux. And you might be overheating. So you might be burning the board a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it probably won't destroy anything. Uh, but it is something to be aware of. Um, so, you know, less brown would be better. Yeah. So just... But that's, it's nothing to beat yourself up about. You're just figuring it out. I feel, so it's like clean, then touch it to the solder wire or touch it, or the, the block yeah. of flux. Cause so, I, like, well, I feel like it's not melting very easily. <laughs> So a lot of times that's just the, the timing and where, so the soldering iron will kind of have like hot spots where it's hottest at the tip or, or elsewhere. I, there, there's a little personality there, at least I found. And so it's getting that spot to touch the pad and the pin. So the key is you want the pad and the pin to be hot and you want to be melting the solder on the pad and the pin because that's where right. the reaction's happening. Um, and then as far as tinning, when you feel like you're not getting heat transferring to the pin is when you want to tin it. So you don't need to tin it every time, but that's when you tin it, it'll generally have solder left on it between the others. Uh, but if you let it sit there for a while, um, and it's sitting there hot, it's also going to oxidize. So that's when you clean it. So if there's been a little while between when you've moved solder on it, you would clean it. And you would clean it periodically every few, maybe every three or so times. Just dip it in the, uh, in the flux. Uh, there might be some harder rules about this, but the, I'm, I'm sharing you my experience. And that's, that's what I've done. So. All right. That's it. I am going to go ahead and add my transistor. The transistor uh, goes pretty obviously in the spot that has the corresponding shape. And I think even the corresponding, uh, if we could read what was on there, the corresponding uh, lettering. So it says on the transistor S8050 which it also says here on the board. So we can be pretty confident. We know the orientation. We know the pins. Put it in there. Um, and you can choose how high up you want it. Uh, I'm gonna try and get it pretty close to the board. Seems like the holes are a little further than the actual component. So uh, that just means that I'm going to, it's going to sit a little proud. It's going to sit a little high. Okay. 
Starting to look like a thing. And we have our switch and our potentiometer. So, potentiometer is pretty clear, matches the diagram right there. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Wiggling the potentiometer in there is a little bit. It doesn't feel flush, or at least it didn't for me. It's no, it's just a couple of millimeters up. Yeah, I think that's okay. Yeah, it just was, it was like, oh, okay, this is how it works. <laughs> directional but it does have a little notch and then it has a notch indicator on the switch so I'm gonna go ahead and play it safe and follow their uh, directions by aligning the, the notch Switch time. Give me 
you guys a second to catch up, and then we'll move on to LEDs. Well, in fact, we might want to, for you LEDs, you might want to. So, so now we've got it. So one thing the kit didn't come with, but I, uh, those of you that got the full electronics kit, um, got some wires. Uh, I, on my other one, just cut some wire I had around the, the house. Um, pretty badly, by the way. But um, we have power, which is a DC current, uh, and four to six volts. So uh, a battery would normally supply is 1.5 volts so we get to three volts with two and we should be able to get right in the range here with three batteries uh, connected we'll also have to figure out how to get the uh, get the wires hooked up so we did have uh, those of you who have the ribbon cables we should be able to use these and then just solder them into the holes in the, the back here that are provided. Um, if you are uh, at home and have some wire, you'd be able to do wire. Ideally, these would lead to battery packs, um, not something that came with the kit or that I thought of in advance, but um, we have a bunch at Make Haven, so I can make those available later for those that want to upgrade. So that's going to be just a little bit of a awkward spot. I'm going to pick a red and a black wire, and I am going to solder them in. Are the big and the little holes in the DC section the same? So the little holes, I don't understand what the little holes do, because they don't seem to have the connections on. They don't have the pads. Mm. So I think they're I think maybe you can stick a wire through them so that the I, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure what they're for. So on on mine the little one has the pad but the big one doesn't. Oh really? Yeah, the little one little one has the pad on mine too. Yeah. So through the little one, I'm gonna click put my uh, red wire through the plus and my black wire through the negative. So, sorry, Chair, with the ribbon cables, do we just, like, rip these off of the, the big stack of them? Yeah, exactly. They, they right. can be removed. I guess I could, okay, I could just take two. I could have it soldered from – now, if I wanted to solder it from the back, uh, there's no pad on the front, so I'd have to solder them this way. I guess I'd – trying to figure out where I want the wires to, do I want the wires coming out of the front of the heart or the back? Uh, probably the backs better, <laughs> cleaner, but it looks like it's set up to go this way. Uh, I'll, I'll do it the way they seem to want it to go. I guess then it can sit for more. Are you using the longer set or the shorter ones? Uh, I, it doesn't matter. I just figured if I'm going to try and connect three batteries to it, uh, I want the longer wire. Makes sense.
And you'll find generally that wires uh, take a little, they're different because they conduct that heat away. They have a lot of place to sink that heat to. So you'll just find that different things behave differently. Does it matter which, I'm sorry, I forget, which is constant? Uh, which right, by convent, it doesn't matter. I mean, the electricity won't care. Right. Well, but the uh, black is negative. It's the convention. Oops. If we're getting a little caught up now, what component are you all on? Um, yeah, so, well, we are attaching the power. Um, so we can uh, answer about any of the components. Are you working on a component that you have a question about? No, we're just trying to figure out how to manage without wire. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, you didn't grab one of these um, rainbow things? Um, nope, that's okay. We'll figure it out. Yep. Uh, if not, you'll have the terrible disappointment of having to wait till we can get you some wire to know whether it works, um, which I apologize for. Okay. So, have my wires going in. And so our last remaining component is LEDs. Does anybody know what LED stands for? Light emitting diode. But I don't okay. actually know what a diode is. You know what a diode is or don't? I do not. Oh, nope, that's not soldered in. Yeah. When the wire falls out, you did not do it right. So, yeah. the, um, so a diode is uh, something that is a one-way gate for electricity, or that's the function of it. Uh, so it only allows electricity to flow one way. And this particular diode will have various, uh, you know, semiconductor specialty minerals, uh, magic sauce, that in that spot where the electrons are jumping from, from one uh, surface to the other surface, uh, it emits or it loses electrons. It, it, it stimulates photons and out comes light. And it actually took many, many years for us to get uh, like blue and other colors. So uh, LEDs are pretty amazing technology. And the fact that we can have so many on this are uh, is, is really an amazing feat. They're so energy efficient. The uh, Because they are diodes at the heart uh, of what they are, uh, they only work one way. And so, again, you'll see that convention where you have two legs, one leg being shorter. As an additional indicator on LEDs, you'll see that they're, and it, it's a bit hard to tell, On it's a lot easier on some other ones, but there is a flat surface. Uh, it's right on that side. So one so it's rounded most of the way around, and then there's one side that's kind of cut off. That cut off side should correspond with the short leg and it indicates that that is the negative side. You can see it a little better as I turn it here. So one side is, short there. is negative, right? Short is negative, exactly. So on this board, you're going to uh, we're going to want to make sure that we put it the right way. And the negative should be the way that the arrow goes to. Before you side of that, let me just double check my other one. So we think the arrow points towards the short leg, right? Uh, I think the arrow, points, the arrow points towards the short leg. That's right. Because I did it last night and it worked. And that's what I did. So arrow points towards the short leg. The other, the other way we could test it uh, would be to burn one out. So this, this little LED probably shouldn't take um, 
too many volts. But let's, uh, I'm going to grab a battery. And I'll uh, put the negative side, the short side on the negative, And then I'll use a wire to connect it to the positive. And we'll see if we get any, any action. Gonna, I need three hands for this. Um, short, short. expect that to go unless it like instantly burnt out um, well so, so are we still testing or are we doing arrow goes to the short side yeah ar arrow goes to the short side you know, why, don't we, why don't we just do a little I'll do a little Google just to double check um, I hope so, because I already got one of them in. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll double check just in case. It also matches the flat side on the, the LED. Oh, yeah, you're, you're right. That's it's it's 100 percent correct. The the flat side to the flat side. All right. Uh, and now I just you just have to go around and. Solder these as you uh, fit. This is practice time. And do we solder the just because there isn't the? Uh, oh wait, no, nope, sorry, I flipped it over. Now, one thing to be a little careful is that they don't, it's very easy for them to fall forward um, when you're working with it upside down. Not that that's a problem, but then you'll just have one that's more forward than the rest, which you may not like. bend it flush while you're holding it in kind of yeah i'm just I, i'm just getting them in some of them go in harder than the others and i'm just bedding the legs out and i'm getting like four or five in and then i'm gonna go through and solder all the backs of them uh of those four or five and then i'm gonna snip them and then i'm gonna go through and do the next ones so there's no we're just in repetitive task mode right now
just working away.
Shannon, it keeps um, jumping over to you. Do you mind um, muting oh. until you can talk? I, that I thought it was recording my soldering. and It's not a big deal. Camera. Camera. Why are we swearing? No, I'm or the camera. To get the camera back. Oh. Uh, so actually, ah. uh, Julie, can I have you mute as well? So it was Shannon, but now you, you're keep seeming to get the camera. I just was saying camera because I couldn't think of any other thing to make a noise to get the camera back. But I suppose swearing could also be appropriate. Uh, I wasn't swearing. It's not beyond me, though. Hey, JR. Yeah. Could you explain how the PCB side works? Wait. Yeah. Hey. So um, you, if you get into electronics, so this is a pre-ordered PCB board, and it is a, um, a wafer of, oh, it's what they make boats out of, um, fiberglass, basically. Uh, 
and there is a layer of conductive material and it just you can get ones that are multiple layers uh, or you can get ones that are single layer this is single layer so rather than wires all of these areas that are in the in this case it's the lighter green actually has a conductive layer of copper that's sandwiched sandwiched in there probably very close to the edge um, and that is what carries the electricity between all of these pins if you are developing something so one of the things that i got and i included with the kit was uh this little guy which is a breadboard and a breadboard allows you to put your components into the holes so they they're in a hole and then on a breadboard the center lanes are connected along uh this axis here so uh back towards the power grid so if i wanted to connect one L led to another i could put it in a uh, one next to it so these two in the same row those two would be connected now the rails go the opposite way so rails go up and down and you can see one's red and one's blue typically you would run power into any one of these pins and then you could grab power and you would bridge it with these types of wires so you might say i want to get power from here uh, to this first led and that would did i did i get the right oh yeah i'm in the right row for the for the for the one and then you obviously have to has to complete the circuit so i would on the other pin i would connect it to say the blue uh but that's breadboards but breadboards are really uh picky because you have all these little pins being held on by all these little clips and all these little things so if you want something to work on the back of your bike to to be attached and to be uh, lighting something up, you don't want to use a breadboard. As soon as water hits the breadboard, anything, movement, there's all these wires to catch things on. Breadboards don't last long. They're great for your initial prototyping. And then once you've done a breadboard, what you can do is called a protoboard. And a protoboard is just a whole bunch of little uh, spots of copper, uh, copper circles and pinholes, like a PCB but with just a regular grid pattern on it. And what you can then do is now you solder your wires connecting that grid pattern to be just specifically your board and you use the through holes to put your through hole components in there. And that you can, it takes time to produce those, but they're gonna be a lot more stable and they're great for doing prototypes. That's why they're called proto boards or, or prototype board. Uh, then after that, you're going to use a piece of software. Uh, there's software out there called Circuit Maker that we've used to make something. Um, it's a website. Uh, there's also Eagle, which is by Autodesk, and that's very popular. And that's now integrated with Fusion 360. And what those will allow you to do is typically you'll have one part where you design the schematic. So you design all of the, all of the elements that what are the components that are going to go into this? And then how are they going to be connected, but not how that is laid out. And then uh, a lot of times the software will do an auto routing and it will figure out the best way for that to be routed through there. And if you have something very complex where things are intertwined, uh, you may have to do multiple layers. And so they can print these PCBs and then they sandwich them together. So you don't see that there's multiple layers. But those multiple layers are there and they have different patterns and they're connecting different uh, elements on your board. And there's something called a VIA, which is uh, VIA, like transport, and that will connect between different layers. You'll see them as like little metal uh, tunnels inside the board. So these, once you've designed them, you can send them out to any number of circuit uh, PCB board printing houses. There's some in New York, there's some in China. Uh, you can pay you know, like a dollar per 
Uh, if you produce more, you pay less. The size of the board matters. If you're going to cut it to a custom shape matters. Um, but they are uh, easy to buy in the hundreds and thousands. Uh, one other thing to mention is some of these houses will actually uh, pre-populate. So you'll pick from a list of components and they have a machine called a pick and place. What a pick and place does is it's like a CNC machine for your components. Your components will all be in little buckets or often in a tape where it will be able to exactly pick that up. It's a little robotic arm that picks it up, drops it on the board, and uh, then it solders it all in place. Typically, when you're getting smaller, so through hole, the things that we're doing, there's all these holes and we're soldering. This is human scale. You can actually work with it, bend it, and see it. Even though it feels small, it's manageable. The, uh, the next level is uh, surface mount soldering. And that is what you're going to see on a lot of computers. When you look at an old 1970s uh, amplifier, it looks like this with all these visible resistors and so on. When you look at more modern software or modern computers and components that run software, you'll see that uh, it, it, it's a very small component with unper almost unperceivable little tiny lines that go down there. And that's done through surface mount soldering at Makehaven. There's a uh, little oven that is, it looks like has a little drawer on it and it's on the, uh, the electronics workbench. And that is for surface mount uh, soldering. You get special components and you print this board so it has little copper pads. And through the magic of flux and solder, the, the solder is actually attracted to those little pads. It wants it to happen. So as long as you place it pretty well on top and it sits loose and there's a mixture of flux and solder it's all mixed in together what you do then is you heat it to this temperature which evaporates off the uh, flux and it brings all of the solder that's in that mix together and it just solders that component magically in place uh to, to watch it happen is it feels kind of magical uh because you see it it's almost like the terminator it's this, you know, the one that was the liquid one that like makes shapes. Everything's spread out. You get it to a temperature and it all, it all just collects around the, the legs of the component you want to solder. It will sometimes even straighten the component out so it lines up with all the pads. And there you go. So that's how uh, a mass production electronic piece would be made. You would print up one of these boards. It would be populated by a pick in place. And it would run through uh, an oven where everything would have this paste on it that applied typically through a mask. That uh, So you're applying it only in the right places. And then that paste evaporates, part of it evaporates away, and the solder remains. And all of your components are at one time soldered to the board. This also makes it very hard for you to repair uh, those, sorts of, those sorts of things. Uh, I have heard of people like just heating and remelting uh, if they had like a loose or loose joint, but mileage may vary. Uh, so I better stop talking and start finishing my um, my LEDs before I get too far behind. How are uh, how are other folks doing? Are you getting through your your LEDs? Down to the last row. Yeah. The inspection and cleanup. Nice. Uh, inspection is important. It is typical to have problems. And I had mentioned that the uh, multimeter is nice to have, but not a need to have. If you find that things aren't working, uh, you can always, knowing what component you have, you can check the conductivity between two pins to make sure that the solder joint is is working. So that's a um, that's an advantage. Uh, it's great for troubleshooting when something doesn't work. And a shout out to a session that's coming up a little later is Lior is going to do a basics of multimeter, which I'm going to attend to because I've fumbled my way through using a multimeter, but never really been good at it. 
And it would be great to have a better fundamental understanding. And I recommend that anyone who ever interacts with electronics uh, gets a good sense of how a multimeter works. You can use them around your house on small components like these. Great tools. Yeah, I used mine like 10 minutes after I got it home. And, and it worked for you? It did. It did, because I had a grounding issue on my brand new 3D printer, and I had to figure out why. And I was able to figure it out. Which is yeah, super the ones that we made available, I mean, those are dirt cheap. They're like 15 bucks or something. But they, um, they were well-reviewed, and there are some good multimeters. Of course, if you're an electrician, if somebody's going to you want a tool for the rest of your life, it's nice to get uh, like a fluke is a good name. And there's uh, a lot of these out there that are high end, but they'll cost you 80, a hundred dollars, 200, 400. You can spend what you want on them. But, uh, that little guy will get you a lot of the way. One of the things that the cheaper ones won't do is they'll generally not give you very specific values when, you know, they're accurate to a range where, the higher end ones are basically adding decimal points uh, for what your certainty is around a current. So when somebody else is done um, setting up, actually I'll just preview for you. Uh, my bootleg battery setup. So I took uh, AA batteries and the electrical tape that was in your kit, I just electrical taped them end to end. So you're going to, each battery is 1.5 volts. Uh, it will say that on the side, um, and that's standard across all batteries. And we know that this is calling for a minimum of 4 volts. So you want to tape together three different batteries end to end. And then what I did is I taped just so they'd hold in place the metal uh, component. And then I had to hold my finger uh, kind of sandwiching the whole contraption so that uh, it would all of the conductors were touching each other. And these were touching the end. And I was able to get my uh, heart to light up. So. Uh, obviously, a nicer little battery compartment is preferred, but this will this will do in a pinch. It has to be double A. Uh, it does not have to be double A. Uh, triple A will also work. Uh, should be one point five. Uh, a nine volt is obviously nine volts. And so uh, I think the limit on this, it said, was, what, seven or something? Uh, you can try it, but it, it's probably going to burn it out. And, um, yeah, so I think any of the batteries will work. But they, you could check on the side to see what voltage they are. I only have two double A's. So you can try the two double A's. It'll probably work. It just may not cycle or it might be dim. But give it a shot and we'll we'll see what we got. Well, I have all sorts of triple A's for some reason. Oh, okay. So they say Yeah. I think triple A's have the same output. They just don't last as long. Oh. Less volume. Somebody can correct me if I'm uh, incorrect about that. It doesn't have like milliwatt hours on this set that I have. Is there?
you touch the oh, sorry what was that you attach the wire to the uh, positive or negative like which one did you start with? or does it matter uh so the one that on the board ultimately ends in the little plus sign goes to the positive uh i, I used red on that but you might have used a different color which one would you like which one did you tape to the battery I, I oh i well, taped both oh you're crazy because there's a switch on the board so I just taped both, and it doesn't really hold them close. So you kind of still have to squeeze it um, to get it to go. But it, uh, the tape at least holds things in place. And I used the electrical tape that just came with the uh, thing. Oh, and I meant to say, uh, the masking tape that I told you that could be helpful, uh, that was for when we were doing components on this board. And if they start falling through, it didn't seem like anybody had trouble with that, but if they start falling through, you can tape them to the back rather than bending the pins outwards. And then you solder them and take the tape off. So that's another little tip. No. No, no worky? No. Did you try turning the switch on and off? Yeah. That's the first uh, thing you turn it off and you turn it back on again. Yeah, so... I expect that I melted... I melted my Molex a little bit. Oh, or it just came off with the battery. The casing of one of the uh, of the negative wire melted a little, the little clicky bit. The wire is okay. Oh. Well, um, let's yeah. take a look at this a second. I, I've got a couple more joints. But take a look. So inspect if it's not working. Uh, look for bridges. Look for reversed LEDs, because one reversed LED will uh, stop the flow flat. Uh, one thing not to do is you don't solder to the battery because the batteries can respond badly to the heat. Like exploding? Like exploding. So mm -hmm. just just heads up. I know that's a, a brilliant idea. But it's is, not. So you shouldn't try to touch up your solder while it's hooked up to the battery, I assume. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends if it's on or on. I, I, I don't think that would be a problem. Okay. Um, but it doesn't hurt to unplug.
position should the potentiometer be in? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't actually know. It's fun across the board. You can change it to the different positions. It does different, different things. things. Yeah. Cool. So you're, you're, you're getting it. I'd love to see uh, you show yours All right. to us when, you, when you're ready. Yeah. Let's see. All right. This requires like one too many hands. Hang on. This. Put this back. Going? What was the problem? I had taped to the wrong side. I swapped them accidentally. That's, you know, we. Like right at the very end, everything went fine. When there's problems, I appreciate simple problems. Yes. Um, and then. Yeah. Funny enough, my example one didn't work. All so right. I want out. But the one I did yesterday, I think that's working. So I'm just. That looks awesome. Thanks, Andrew. Well, nice. Yeah. Cool. Little beating okay. heart. Say stuff. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there you go. Keep, keep talking as we're watching. So, so it is Mine's not electrocuting me, so that's a good start. Mine's not beating, but it's it's on. Hold on, I can make it. Um, where's Where's the uh, potentiometer at? Um, it's it's go east west, I guess. <laughs> I have like the slot going north south with the EOS on the left. Okay. No, it's still. Very cool. Thanks, JR. Yeah. Well, so I've got mine. I've got mine lit up, but the uh, well, my, it, mine's uh, not beating yet. Okay. I gotta figure out. You know, I'll mess with the potentiometer. See if that's it. Maybe something's bridged that's bypassing the, uh, you know, the butt. button works. Certainly better battery holding would, would help. Power, um, so Shannon, you got, did you get yours going? It flashed for like half a second. Ha! <laughs> um, Tempting. I think it's because I melted the plastic on my positive power lead. So I I'm gonna try to desolder it and yep. maybe tr try another one. Just try troubleshooting. You think that might be it? Cause I did the same thing on my negative. Did you replace it and it worked? No, I have not replaced it yet. I mean, the, the lights on. So since mine's running but it's not responding, I'd be looking for bridging. Would be my suspicion. Oh, you mean on but not blinking? Yeah, I have the same thing. As mine's on but not blinking. So, what did we do wrong? It seems like we got a lot right because all the LEDs are lighting up. Mm -hmm. It's working. Resistors must be in the right place. Um, 
Yeah, something must be bridged. So just look over it carefully, and you can use your solder wick. Kate and Stephen, how are you guys doing? Uh, Stephen said he was putting the kids to bed. Uh, the <laughs> we're we're, we're oh, kind back. of working on it, but so we don't. Somehow we ended up without wire, but the solder. Yeah, it, I think real pretty. I was putting the wire in the kit manually. It wasn't part of the kit um, to start. So if you grabbed a kit without me packing it, it probably didn't get included. Yeah, I think I think Kate grabbed uh, grabbed our kit. So yeah. we're gonna get some wire, and we we finished one of them. Uh, Eliza ran out of steam about halfway through. Kate got about three quarters of the way through before uh, she had to step away. But I think we're getting the hang of it. I don't yeah, know that I have a second career in this, but uh, I, th I think I got it pretty well figured out. Yeah, and the the point here was to figure out how to solder and uh learn you know get some practice and i think you achieved that yeah i mean and, they both look like volcanoes than anything else you know i only only bridged once and you know yeah they well i just bridged right now <laughs> you see i got that nice bridge. um so if you were to use a multimeter you could go through and test the various connections and follow the loop all the way around. Uh, that's a lot to do, but that would be one way to troubleshoot, right? And what you'd I have could, to do. I could do that. Sorry, you're breaking up a little bit. I, we could do that at the store. Multimeter thing. Uh, yeah, so I think like in the multimeter thing, we'll go over how multimeters work and then you use some examples. And so if you have something like this, although it might be tough in a group setting to specifically troubleshoot, um, mm -hmm. if you have your multimeter there, um, we, can, we can see, you know, we can see what you can do with it. Um, but I'm also planning to attend the multimeter workshop. What we normally do is continuity. So there should be a setting. I'll, I'll grab the, I brought a, one of these ones like we had home. Oh. Um, so, no. no, that's really zoomed in. But um, I ordered one, but it did not come in yet. Okay. Yeah, so there, there's one that should have continuity, which basically is, I should be able to get it in this screen. See the thing with like the beep? And the mm -hmm. little arrow and the plus, uh, yes. that should beep when there is a connection. And so, if you're looking for spots where a connection is happening, where it shouldn't be, or a connection should be made, uh, just having something that beeps at you to tell you that that's happening I is a very useful function. And yeah. so, that would be that would be basically the extent of my troubleshooting. Would be going around and and trying to figure out, well, is this supposed to be connected to this? And then seeing if it beeps. Uh, keeping in mind that diodes are one way. So you'll have to, when you test an LED, it will not beep one way and it will beep the other. Mm. So that's, you have to understand what the components are to uh, successfully troubleshoot them really. Where where do you put the leads in on the multimeter? Which ones go in which way? Yeah, so uh, it changes based on the function, and the uh, it should be I think the first two, the terminal A ten max, and the other one because the other one is com. So uh, one and three. What is that? One and three? I think it's one, uh, one and two. Okay. But what I would do 
is uh, put them in those those two. Go to the continuity setting, and then um, see if it beeps at you. And if it doesn't beep, try the other one. Was it the other one? Uh, two and three works. Red and two and black and three. All right. See, this is why I need the class. I had to read the manual before I took my printer apart to try it. That's the only reason I know. And I used to have to use these at work, but I clearly wasn't paying attention. Well, and I know there's typically one that will be have a fuse on it. And so there's like, you want to not use higher voltage in the wrong uh, socket. So that's a consideration, something to, to learn. Because these types of things, and you should always read the multimeter to make sure, but these are used, uh, I use my multimeter around the house to check what my, uh, you know, 110 electrical is doing. So. Great. So we have some working hearts, some not. You know how it goes. Hearts are made to be broken. <laughs> um, Oh, yeah. I have two little wires touching that. That might do it. Bridges. Oh, that needs a little more solder. If you don't get anything, look for where you missed. I need to sign off. Thanks again. This was really fun. Yeah. Well, I, thank you. Um, thanks for attending. I think we're all uh, in pretty good shape. I'm going to check the comments, make sure there's nothing I miss. Uh, yeah, Steven signing off. Um, great. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, let me know if you have any other questions. Uh, we covered the, the basics of doing this little project together and see at the multimeter or other other activities. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, JR. And thank you, thanks for being cool and creative with these online things. Yeah. Well, if you have um, if you have any in mind that you think would be fun, either to suggest or to host with the threshold of hosting them being pretty low. So I don't want people to feel they have to be experts at all. Um, you know, let me know or just go to the events and click propose event because you can put, you can put something on there and then we'll follow up and yeah. So feel free to share. Great. Cool. Yeah. The one that, um, I need to see how they did it, but um, I've had some friends who have been like as grad school lab meetings doing bake alongs mm -hmm. where like everybody brings their laptop into the kitchen and they all make a recipe together. Same one. Yeah, like, like biscuits or sugar cookies or like something fairly straightforward, but I'm going to ask my old professor and see like how they did it. But they had like 12 people and like it's part of their like weekly pandemic life now as they have a bake along as part of their team meeting. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think uh, we're, we're willing to try, try anything.
All right, well, my dogs are looking at me like, hey, Shani, you were supposed to feed me an hour ago. So I'm going to sign off. Thanks, y'all, and have a good night. Thank you.